Petrie is next up, and she is an interdisciplinary artist currently based, we are so happy, in Salina, Kansas, um, where she's working here at the Land Institute as a research resident. Through large-scale objects and installations, ephemeral sculpture, sculpture, performance, drawings, and process-based work, she explores systems of value and cultural relations to the land and the more-than-human world with attention to histories of injustice. Sounds about right. Her current research is focused on Midwestern agriculture as both an important cultural signifier and a deeply troubled relationship to the land. Before she comes up, I want to let you know that she has an amazing exhibit here in our galleries. Check them out before you leave. And she also has, that wasn't enough to hold her vision. Um, and so she has more work downtown at the Salina Innovation Center um, in a building uh, formerly known as the Masonic Temple. And it is called Red Dirt Rug. It will be there through Friday, and you should not miss it. I welcome Raina to tell us more about her work. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be here with you all on this dirt floor of this storied barn. Um, dirt floors have certain mythology in my life. <laughs> I was often reminded as a kid that when my parents purchased the limestone house that I grew up in, it was just the frame of a house with uh, just open windows and dirt floors. Um, so I think about that often. Um, I could easily fill up this time just by thanking each person who has made it possible for me to be here and those who have welcomed me, worked with me, helped or inspired me over the last several months. And I want to express my deep, deep gratitude to the entire Land Institute staff for, um, for your kindness and your generosity. It's an incredible gift to be a part of this community and it's one that I know will continue to influence me immeasurably. I do need to name a few people <laughs> individually, many of whom who are here. I especially want to thank my fellow research residents, Alex, Abby, and Eric, and the Perennial Oil Seeds Program for energetically embracing and supporting me and my work. Uh, my teachers and mentors, Karen McCoy and Matt Burke, who introduced me to the Ecosphere Studies community. Donna Sandberg, who um, generously has been sharing her knowledge with me and helping me learn how to weave. Mary Landis from the Salina Innovation Foundation for hosting the installation of my work downtown. Uh, and Corey North, who has enthusiastically taken on the role of coordinating artists for Prairie Festival. I also want to say thank you to uh, everyone who loaned me their ecosphere for the gallery exhibition. Um, and uh, I am incredibly grateful to Aubrey Streit Krug for inviting me to come and research here and for continuing to remind me, um, both in our conversations and through her own work, an example that we need work that translates and connects and bridges the gap between scientific knowledge and our everyday lives and experiences. Finally, uh, I also wanna say thank you to my folks and my partner, Sam, for their abiding support and encouragement. And I wanna acknowledge two of my heroes who I certainly could not be here without, Terry Evans, who has contributed her work and wisdom to the Land Institute since its very beginning. Terry has been integral in weaving beauty and art and the importance of close observation into the work of this organization through her own work and by bringing the voices and perspective of many other artists to the, to the Land Institute over the years. And Wes Jackson who imagined and cultivated a space where science, history, art, and poetry not only could coexist and interact, but must. I'm inspired and encouraged by Wes and Terry's friendship and collaboration spanning some 50 years. 
if I come out of this experience with just one 50-year friendship, I'll be satisfied. <laughs> Uh, their relationship is a testament to the necessary work of connecting the threads of different disciplines, or as Wes might say, forcing knowledge out of its categories. It is that spirit that drew me to the Land Institute. My own work is rooted in themes of memory and place, of attention to the more than human world. My practice often involves collecting, processing, and repetition and ritual. I'm interested in reckoning with human impact and thinking about the ways that we process ecological grief in the face of troubled times on a damaged planet. I work with materials like plants and seeds and water and dirt. I transform these things into drawings and objects and installations. I think about the inherent and poetic qualities that live in these materials. For example, Seeds not only contain the genetic material of the plant, they might also hold deep temporal knowledge of both human and plant ingenuity. Soil contains a written story. It can be read chemically, biologically, and physically, and it can also be understood emotionally. It is why we are drawn to collect soil from sites of personal or cultural significance. When I came to the Land Institute earlier this year, one of my intentions was to contemplate the symbolism of wheat in this region. I wanted to explore the intersections of agriculture, memory, and emotion. If you grew up in rural Kansas like I did, you probably have a memory attached to the harvest sunset or amber waves of wheat. And given my process-based practice, I thought, what better way to understand wheat than to grow some? And what better place to do it than here? So these themes of agriculture and emotion and memory come together for me in a small bundle of annual wheat seeds that I've carried with me since 2010. It was gathered from the site of a grain elevator collapse that happened in my hometown. And I thought that cultivating some of this wheat might act as a mourning ritual, as a way of processing grief. In terms of growing that wheat, I did pretty much everything wrong. The seed was nearly, seed was nearly a decade old, so it had probably lost most of its carefully bred defenses. The seedlings were started in the greenhouse and cooled in the fertilization chamber instead of planting in the field in the fall and allowing them to overwinter. I then transplanted them to their plot in the spring, which I'm told is unconventional. <laughs> and finally, since I was more interested in beauty and elegy than production or yield, I decided to plant my rows of wheat between the existing rows of perennial gray-headed coneflower. My research plot proved to be an excellent habitat for all kinds of life, pests and pollinators, and weeds, and rabbits, and deer. The deer ensured that I have an honorable harvest, consuming about half of my plants. And when it came time to harvest, the wheat was nearly swallowed up by the coneflower. So what purpose did this experiment serve? And what lessons did I learn? What did I gain from doing this, aside from a sunburn and dozens of insect bites and a small bouquet of wheat? I'm still processing that, but here are some of my reflections. Each time I visited my plot, I walked through the Wahab Prairie, um, just over here across the road. I studied the plants and flowers. I learned some of their names and marveled at the complexity and changes from day to day. I thought about how so many wheat fields that define the landscape were once prairies that were once oceans. To my surprise, as I paid close attention to these plants, to their growth and structure, my wheat broke free from its symbolism and became simply itself. I marveled as the first seed heads emerged from the stem. There's a brief moment when all of the delicate awns of the spikelets are gathered together in the collar of the flag leaf just before they emerge into that familiar form of the spike. 
I found myself astounded by the tender architecture of this plant, the result of thousands of years of human and plant knowledge. I realized how delicate these plants are and how much they rely on our care as I carefully unraveled bindweed from thin stems. I found that rituals, no matter how odd they may seem, can be healing. And agriculture involves plenty of rituals, primarily weeding. <laughs> this work was not really about harvesting a crop. It was about the experience of knowing these plants and caring for them. There's a photograph on display over here in the gallery um, documenting my plot just before harvesting. There's a small cluster of golden wheat standing erect in the center of the frame, and it's surrounded and utterly embraced by the towering cone flower. Its buds are about to burst into bloom under a blue sky, and the image to me appears like a shrine. The combination of work on display in the barn gallery is not a culmination, but rather an accumulation from the last several months of processes and experiments, practices and collaborations. It's representative of the research process. The show includes work that's made by and with others, meditations on soil loss and formation, studies of sylphium roots and their entanglements with fungi, woven forms that double as measuring devices, and drawings derived from prairie plants. It is both exciting for me and scary to invite you into my research process, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share it with you all. As Rachel mentioned, in addition to the work here in the gallery, there's an installation of my work downtown created for this event. This is the latest iteration of a piece that I've been developing over the past few years. The piece, titled Red Dirt Rug, is an ephemeral sculpture in the form of an ornate carpet. It's made from the iron-rich red dirt of Oklahoma, where I lived from 2016 to early 2019. This work is part sculpture and part performance and meditation. It embodies the complicated history of our relationship to land and the weight of human impact. It questions our perceptions and challenges the way that we ascribe value to land and how we leave our mark. Dirt is embedded with history, both literally and metaphorically, scientifically and culturally. In the words of the soil scientist Henry Jansen, the land faithfully records both our failings and our foresights. Each time I make this work, I contemplate how humans have impacted and altered our world, and I wonder about alternatives. I believe that the human footprint is not inherently destructive. So how can our actions become less violent and more tender and generative? For this particular iteration of the work, I worked on the piece over the course of a week on the eve of the largest climate protest in history. The rug is located in the elegant atrium of an old Masonic temple. This massive building is architecturally stunning, and it's an astonishing symbol of wealth from the early 20th century. Thus, it is inextricably tied to industrialization and the exploitation of land and resources. Today, this beautiful building shows signs of neglect, and while parts of it are crumbling, an incredible amount of volunteerism and work are going into caring for it. People are reimagining that space to use in ways that will benefit the community. And this sounds strikingly similar to a land ethic to me. So I invite you to visit this work um, tomorrow afternoon following the closing remarks. And I also would encourage you to visit an exhibition that's on view at the Salina Art Center, featuring the work of my friend Aaron Wiersma. This show includes work created in and with one of the most beautiful places that I know, the Conza Prairie. So again, I am incredibly grateful to be here with you all this weekend in a space like this where we can imagine together how to care for our damaged places. 
I'm excited to listen and learn and think with this creative community. Thank you.